I am excited to introduce and tell you about today's speaker, Liz Kozakria. After earning three degrees at the SUNY Oswego programs in biology in 2011, cognitive science in 2013, and a master's in human inter and computer interaction in 2015, Liz Kozakria started her career in user experience research at Urban Outfitters HQ in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Liz continued her career by taking on positions large and small at startups including Retail Me Not, Spreetail, and Leafly in Austin, Texas, all with the same goal, start and evolve a strategic research program and build a strong team of curious, empathetic, and passionate researchers. She is currently research or leads a research practice at RigUp in Austin, Texas as their first staff user researcher. When she is not head down in research activities, you can find her sewing, baking bread, or outside enjoying the Texas weather. And with that, please welcome me enjoying Liz Kozakria. Thanks, Rebecca. You did great on my last name. I know it's a mouthful. You did awesome. <laughs> Thanks for joining y'all. I'm going to share my screen. Play that and hopefully you can see this presentation. It's all set. It looks perfect. Awesome. Great. So like Rebecca said, I'm Liz Kazakria. Um, I do UX product and design research and I'm located down here in Austin, Texas which I think is a bit warmer um, than, than where I, I'm sure some of you folks are. So the agenda here today, I'll just bring you through um, a really quick introduction just to make me feel a little bit more human to y'all. Uh, a brief overview, just a very high level bird's eye view of user research. I think that's gonna be useful in setting the context um, for bringing you through my education and work history. And then I'm gonna dive into some of the career preparation and opportunities and some of my favorite kind of inspiration um, sort of resources that I go to. Uh, I'm gonna stop after every slide and then if there's any questions, Rebecca will ask them there. So feel free, I do like things to be conversational or if you wanna wait to the end, uh, I have a slide there as well as my contact information. So a little bit about me. I started my life in Lockport, New York, spent about eight years in Oswego, uh, moved to Philadelphia, didn't know anyone there, took a job. It was great. Got sick of winter, decided to move down to Austin, Texas, and I've been here for about three years now. A lot of times people ask about, you know, how are you dealing with the pandemic and quarantine? So a little bit about me. Uh, my favorite thing to do before was to go out and eat, try new restaurants. I hated cooking, I hated baking, but now I love it. Um, so that's been great. I did jump on the bread making bandwagon and went all in on that. A new read that I'm really excited about uh, that I would recommend to really anyone inside, outside of the user research industry is by Kate Murphy. It's called You're Not Listening. Um, what you're missing and why it's important. It's about how we can all be better listeners. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, if you guys sent out this presentation, there's links in there of where you can buy the book. So user research, I'm gonna talk about, like I said, at the highest level, what it is and why it's important. So to start user research, you might've heard, you know, you might hear UX research, user experience research, design research, product research, digital product research. For the sake of simplicity and for this presentation, I'm gonna roll all of those up and just refer to it as either user research or UX research, depending on the company that you go at, uh, maybe go work for, or you know the specific position, there might be some nuances to that role, but really at the highest level, it really focuses on user behavior, their wants, their needs, any motivations, attitudes, opinions, this could also be, you know, non-users who spit your user profiles, right? But you're identifying all of that through a variety, through a plethora of different techniques, techniques and methods. Those could include surveying, you know, uh, user interviews, more ethnographic research, contextual inquiries, like going on site into people's environments, things like that, even A-B testing. And it really provides a deep and empathetic understanding of their users, their experiences, and their journeys. You might ask yourself, why is that important? Well, in industry, without user research, a lot of times decisions are made based on assumptions, based on internal opinions, right? People who might not know the ins and outs of what a user's life is like, so they're making decisions on just what they think. And a lot of times this can result in either product or service failure. 
this is kind of a day in the life. These are pictures from um, my time at Retail Me, not the first one. Uh, I went into folks' home to understand how they fill and refill their medical uh, prescriptions, what they go through, you know, what environment they're in, what distractions do they face, what tools, technologies, and resources do they or do they not use everything like that. And then the second picture is me collaborating with a couple of designers on my team. The backdrop is beautiful downtown Austin, Texas. Uh, lots of post-it notes in my line of work, lots of, lots of Sharpie, very fun. Um, that's so we can like kind of just rapidly move things around and, and everything like that. And then the last picture is, is one of those kind of affinity mapping or, or groupings of pain points that we identified throughout this research project. It is a very quick glimpse into user research in the day in the life kind of. Um, does anyone have any questions about that at this point? If not, totally fine. We'll jump into my education and work history. So school, like Rebecca said, I have three wonderful degrees from SUNY Oswego. I spent uh, a lot of time there. A lot of different reasons. Um, you know, my biology degree was great. I minored in chemistry and psychology. It was a very traditional program, um, or my time there was very traditional. I was on the women's lacrosse team. I, I worked, I was involved in, in some things. Um, but after that, I, I really didn't have a good definition of, of what I wanted to do, what I was, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. But I was really interested in psychology. So I decided to go back and pursue degree in cognitive science from SUNY Oswego. So I got my bachelor's of science in that. After that, I thought uh, I was going to get my PsyD in neuropsychology. And my mentor at the time, Craig Gracie, who was wonderful, um, you know, had brought to my attention human computer interaction. And he was like, you know, I think you should learn more about this. I think you'd be a great fit for this industry. Talk to Damien, get an understanding of it, and just make maybe, you know, come back and we'll talk about it. That's exactly what I did. I learned about it and thought it was really cool. It would be a great fit for me. Um, you know, I am very scientific in nature, but also have a very creative side and, and UX and human computer action, I think is, is a great fit for people like that. So during my time at school, um, you know, I'd mentioned Craig, mentorship was huge for me. Um, you know, I, always just, I had great mentors throughout my cognitive science and human computer interaction programs. Um, Christopher Harris, who's no longer with SUNY Oswego, um, was my mentor for when I was pursuing my master's and he was really great. You know, him, Craig, David Benpolo, they all pushed me into things that I was interested in or maybe didn't know about. And that was really, really uh, pivotal to the success that I've had in my career. I was also during my human computer interaction masters was familiarized with a lot of different methodologies and tools, right? So not only like surveying and building surveys, I was interviewing other students, interviewing staff. I got to work with eye tracking equipment, which was awesome that, you know, you don't always get the opportunities to do so. Um, I learned about crowdsourcing. I was using a lot of different platforms to recruit outside of student bodies and everything like that. And that really helps out me up for success for the rest of my career. Um, during my last two degrees, I was also uh, kind of a non-traditional student. I was commuting from Rochester, New York. I learned a lot about time management. Uh, I was also you know, working two jobs, pursuing degrees, commuting throughout winter and snow. Um, so I learned a lot about that and about communicating you know, needs and priorities with, with my mentors and which other, with other folks that I was working with because group projects were super, helpful and important. I got to work with a lot of different personalities, a lot of different folks, a lot of different backgrounds. Take those seriously. Um, yeah, just do that. Um, and then also take every opportunity you can to present your work. Uh, get comfortable in, you know, communicating what you've done, your processes. Get comfortable, you know, speaking in front of people if you want to go into kind of the, the user research industry, it's important. I'm constantly presenting. I'm constantly doing workshops, just being comfortable talking in front of other people, but also to other people. Um, and I know it can be hard. I'm actually very introverted and stuff. So do what you need to do to get comfortable with that. Know your limits. Um, and that's something that my three degrees from SUNY Oswego really helped me and really taught me. 
So early on in my career, when I was pursuing my um, master's, I also started working as um, a very junior UX researcher at user testing. And I actually tapped into the Oswego alumni network uh, for this. So there was a recent graduate from the HCI master's program, Brian, who started working at user testing got wind of it, they needed some very, very entry-level folks to help out just reviewing research plans, working with more senior folks. Um, you know, and that was, that was really pivotal for my career. It, while I was pursuing my master's as well as uh, working at user, tested, user testing, it really helped me see how, what I was learning in school was translating to industry. Um, that got me into Urban Outfitters. I was their first ever hire this position was super important for the rest of my career. Um, if you're not familiar with Urban Outfitters, it's a very big uh, fashion company. Um, they are, they, they're, you know, very old, very established. So they do have a lot of money to put into new programs and things like that. So I was given the opportunity to work with best in class tools, um, whether that was like surveying, like Medallia, like different in-store tools, research tools, analytics functions, things like that. And really my schooling set me up for success in that because I did have a lot of familiarity and comfort with a lot of different research methodologies, which uh, Urban Outfitters was looking for as their first uh, research hire, they needed someone to get in and just start executing on some work. I also took on the opportunities to start freelancing, just learning about some other industries, um, you know, help proving the value of research and just a little extra money on the side and just to get really more visibility into how other companies operate their research needs and how to just do some uh, or work with different methodologies there. So that was really uh, early in my career. Also, mentorship is, is a huge common thread throughout like I had great mentorship at SUNY Oswego with my degree programs and also throughout uh, my early career I really latched on to my first ever manager who actually still serves as a mentor for me in this industry and it's great we, are, we have a really good relationship we we're able to establish like trust very early on of you know what I'm looking for what I need from him how we can communicate and things like that and that was super helpful as I kind of transitioned to my mid-career. And I started taking on managing people. Uh, that was a big goal of mine, right? I wanted to build a team. Uh, I want that team to be successful. I want it to influence the business, everything like that. And my mentor was super supportive of that. He was my manager at the time um, and really helped me kind of reach and achieve those goals, right? And I've, I had really good success there. Um, in this kind of mid-career as growing like growing teams and, and myself professionally, it was really taking on a more strategic direction um, to not just like execute on, on requests of research, but really help the business and, and shape the vision of um, the future of where they were going and how they could innovate and things like that. This is the time also I was kind of becoming a mentor for others. I saw how important mentorship was to me. So I wanted to be able to provide that back to, you know, the community, whether that was just the Oswego community, whether that was other folks that I met throughout my time in Philadelphia and just, you know, people who just reach out and said they were interested, whether it be LinkedIn or friends of friends and, and things of that nature. This was also the time after URBN, I had a great run there. I did want to kind of get uh, out of you know, e-commerce in the sense of like higher end e-commerce. So if you know about the URBN, URBN portfolio, it's anthropology, it's free people, it's urban outfitters. It, it is on the steeper cost side. And I want to pivot and get an understanding of a different consumer on the different end of the spectrum. I also wanted to get away from the snow. So I moved down to Austin, Texas. I was the first ever UX researcher at Retail Me Not. I was brought in to really establish a strategic research program to level up uh, you know, our designers to be able to execute on some of their own research and make the results more uh, reliable. And this was the time I was starting to transition to a startup world. So URBN, Urban Outfitters, really big enterprise company, very established. Retail Me Not, I, you know, I went from working with like two to 3,000 folks to like two to 300 folks. A um, lot less hoops to jump through, different challenges that, that I had to face, um, a lot more just training, a lot more education and things like that. Time at Retail Me Not was great. I got a really good opportunity to go to Spreetail, which is a very new startup, uh, about 100 
or so people there um, to, to really lead their program. There is a researcher there and to really help and scale uh, UX research at Spreetel. We actually all got laid off three months into my time at Spreetel. So that's just one of the risks that you take with uh, working with startups. But now I'm, I'm kind of in the latter half of, of you know, or in where I'm at currently. So after we were all laid off from Spreetail, about 35 of us from that company got hired for a cannabis software company called Leafly out of Seattle, Washington. Um, I was hired on to manage their UX research team. I had three researchers under me. And again, they were just kind of executing on very tactical things, not a strategic level. There was no larger program around research. There's no formalized process or anything like that. So I was brought in there to help build and grow that. Unfortunately, about six or seven months in, that was the time when COVID hit. I'm sure we've all just dealt with it in, in different ways and impacted or affected by it in different ways. Fortunately, myself and team, along with about a hundred other folks from Leafly were laid off. Um, Again, I know like Urban Outfitters, big company, they had laid offs, even smaller companies lately, like everyone, you know, was severely impacted by it. However, this did give me an opportunity to consult for lots of different companies um, to help them with their research needs. And I think this was really pivotal. I guess the silver lining of, of everything that happened was really showing companies, how important it is, how important a UX research or user research function is to have in there to be able to anticipate when, when something goes awry or something happens, you know, how are users going to feel? How are they, you know, acclimating to this new change and things like that. So actually getting this consultant work was, was pretty easy. I was actually getting a lot of hits of like, hey, can you run this project for us? We just, we don't know what our users are thinking, things like that. So I worked with, um, you know, really small startups for and uh, college admissions. They had about like 50 employees versus Wawa. If you know anything about like the Philadelphia, New Jersey region is like a fast casual dining restaurant and um, for an agency that was actually doing a really big project for Northwestern Mutual. So for a very established, I think 150 year old company. That was all great and fun, you know, just, kind of kept my wheels grease there, just doing research, executing on that. And then I got a great opportunity of where I'm at now is at a startup, another startup down here in Austin um, called Rig Up. We are going through a transition. We're going actually through a really big rebrand, a really big change. And it was a great opportunity for me to get in at the right time to start executing and building this research program. Um, and to really help shape the future of the company by providing not only these strategic higher level insights and you know executing on some more tactical research for product and design teams to move forward but just really continuous and, and that really actionable feedback for those teams and really building partnerships and everything like that so that's where i'm at now um i still have the same mentor from urban outfitters i serve as a mentor for for other folks and that has just been pivotal if i'm you know really stuck or have a question i'll just reach out to him it's like what do you think can I get your thoughts on it? Help me. <laughs> and, and that's been really great. So I'm going to stop there. I kind of breezed you that. Are there any, any questions? Any? Uh... So the first question I have to ask, um, with all of your degrees and like different concentrations, uh, do you find yourself using any of the skills you acquired from your earlier concentrations in your work now? Yeah. Um, so my biology degree was pivotal into, you know, just the scientific method. So user research follows a, a pretty formalized, I'm going to say that loosely, process that is based off of that kind of sci more scientific method. There is just like looser, you know, restrictions. You can integrate a little bit more like creativity kind of aspects in in the process with um, user research. But yeah, I the researcher who's working uh, with me most recently, her degrees in chemistry, same thing. It's it, and it's a lot of like that analytical thinking, things like that. Cognitive science, similar with, you know, I, psychology was a big part of that though, but just different labs and stuff. And then the actual like um, human computer interaction just there's a book that I have linked that I think in cognitive science, I think I actually got my cognitive science degree, but I've used like throughout um, my human computer action degree and it's called the craft of research. Um, and really throughout early of my career, I always reference, reference that. So yeah, it, they've definitely 
served as a great platform. My next question is, with all that you have done establishing different UX researchers at these small start startups and also overseeing such large teams, what do you think help you stand out to get to the positions where you have been? And where are you setting up major projects and getting recommended from other positions? Okay, I'm gonna start with the first half of that project. What made me stand out? I think it's two things. One, I think it's my uh, my ability to take something and put a kind of creative twist on it. Um, so, you know, whether that's using a different tool in a different way, whether that's just asking questions in a different way, whether that's doing maybe spinning up a different deliverable um, and just getting people engaged in the research. That's number one, I think, of what has, has helped me be successful. And that actually started my cognitive science degree. I was starting to think about things like just in a, a minorly different way. Um, for example, I one of my classes, Neural Networks, with David Vampola, we had to write a paper. And I was also reading this book, Do Gentlemen Prefer Blondes um, by Jenna, I, for, I forget her name. And I actually took that book and you know, the, neur the neural nets project that I had to work on and actually combined it. And I think that paper actually won one of the SUNY Oswego awards. Um, and so it's just like that, that minor creative thinking of getting people engaged on or putting things together that it's like, I don't, I don't know if this would actually work, but it does. That's number one. I think that has made me stand out and be successful in my career. The second thing is I'm just, I have a lot of humility and I'm so open <laughs> to just like hearing other people out. I have never gone into a place and especially a new startup that has said like, hey, this is the way that we're gonna do it. A lot of times when you go into industry and you, and you start at a new place or, or someone comes in and they're like, I came from Amazon, we did it at Amazon, it worked at Amazon, so we're gonna do it here. You have to take a step back and be like, okay, that worked at Amazon, how did like, why do we think it's gonna work here? I would just question things and not in like a defensive type of way, but just to understand their thought process of like, okay, that worked at Amazon, but like, you know, Leafly. So yeah, I'm assuming a, a lot of you know what Amazon is. Leafly was a cannabis software company and they wanted to model everything they were doing after Amazon. That didn't work. We went through actually when I was there, my seven months I was there, we went through three rounds of layoffs, two prior to even COVID. Um, you know, and so I I go into a lot of humility and say, you know, this is what's worked for me in the past. How and what if do we think it's going to work here? And I'm I've been super open to compromising, making strategic partnerships, um, and everything like that. So I'd say those two things kind of paired together have really helped me um, kind of be successful and build these teams. Rebecca, I don't know the second half. I can't remember the second half of that question. So can you repeat the second half? So with what you said helped you stand out, is that what helped you get set up to help in such major projects and getting recommended to these other positions? Yeah, totally. Oh my, the, the um, partnerships and friendships that I've made and just like these things and, and um, just, within companies, like I just had a call some that I worked with at Leafly, a director who's like, please come on to our team to be a director of user research. Like we had a great working relationship, love your thought process, like let's do it. And it's really like making those connections, not burning any bridges. And, you know, just, I also just like, we, I make an effort too to like reach out to folks and be like, you know, how's everything going? How are you doing? And vice versa, people reach out to me just like, how are you doing? You know, how's rig up? How's, How's your new gig going and stuff and, and just keeping things kind of just pretty informal, light and, and stuff like that. But yeah, making those those partnerships and and um, ties super important. Next, I have a question from Damien. He said that first off, thank you for coming and talking to the students. We really do appreciate it. Uh, you repeatedly said that companies that you work for had little to no UX slash HCI experience. Isn't it amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it is amazing. Damien, it is crazy. Like right now, I'm the only one out of my team. I work with um, seven designers. I'm the one, I'm one of the only ones with my master's and like formal HCI training, um, which has been one of like my really big advantages. Like people will like 
come to me and ask questions like how can we make these processes better like you have formal training in this like what can we do and like really value my my perspective and then the next question he had was do you think it's getting better out there that more companies are seeing the need for ux slash hdi researchers I do. Yes. Uh, it's something that I actually talk about in my career preparation, my next slide. So we will get into that, but short answer, yes. And then the next question is from James. He said, which might go along with your next slide, so you can tell me if to hold off on the answer. Uh, do you see UX research as a career in high demand? Yes. I'm just going to like pan to my next slide. Yes. User research specifically is becoming a specialty practice, right? So before, I'm sure you can go back to Wayback Machines, you can look before, a lot of times, and some companies still do, is that they conflate like UX design and UX research, or they want a designer to do research, vice versa. From when I started to now, it has evolved into being a specialty practice. And when I talk to companies now, they want someone who just like specializes in research knows the ins and outs, maybe generalizes in, in methodology, which my time at um, attaining my HCI master's really helped me out with. Um, but, you know, someone who's not gonna have to compromise doing design work and doing really robust, good research. And it's also within that strategic pr practice, it's also um, has become a, a higher, more strategic level kind of influence in companies that, that people I think are, are it, they're latching onto it more as kind of dynamic, you know, the world is becoming with, with technology, with all these different product saturations, you know, humans just being perpetually dissatisfied and, and everything like that. Um, it has, it's becoming a, a super sought after specialty career. And it's also becoming increasingly competitive, which we can talk about, uh, in, in a couple of my other kind of bullet points that I have, but any other questions about, about uh, pertaining to that, Rebecca? Um, I just have one more question that was kind of for the last slide that I missed. Yeah. They said that it's really great that you've persevered through some of the risks and things didn't quite plan out as you had thought. Any advice for young professionals as they should experience layoffs throughout their career? Yeah, um, keep your head up. It, it is rough, I was laid off twice within a year, um, you know, it, it's rough, but it's not the end all be all. I did learn a lot from like startups of like questions that I should ask, like how much runway do you have? <laughs> like really simple questions like that, that Google does have the answer to. But if you are really interested in startups because startups are such a good opportunity. Um, one of my old, uh, previous directors, you know, is like, it's like a roller coaster and it, it's high risk, but it can be really high reward too. Um, in my career preparations, you know, one of the things you do want to reflect on if you want to get into this career is, you know, company size and maturity. Do you want to go to the urban outfitters? They're more established. They're really big. They have some money to back up different tools. There's just maybe a little bit more um, like politics and optics that you have to deal with. Maybe a lot more hoops that you have to jump through. Um, maybe way more stakeholders. And you're not going to necessarily run as fast and as nimble as if you were going to be at a startup, which, you know, you might have to wear a lot more hats. Uh, you might, you know, get responsibilities that you don't think you're ready for. Just do it, take it on, ask questions, have the humility and, and everything like that. Um, you know, and if, and if you do get laid off, like, you know, when I was going through interviews, they're like, oh, you didn't spend much time here. Like what happened or like things, and, you know, I'm just, I was very open. I was like, listen, I was laid off. The whole company was laid off. It, ha it happens in every industry that like, no one's gonna hold it against you. So don't feel like you have to, you know, be all shy or, or quiet about it. it. It happens and there there will be other opportunities out there. I'm a classic case where I, I was laid off twice and, you know, whether it's consulting work, you know, just tapping into your network of being like, hey, do you have some like projects that, that you need help with or that I can contract for? That's a great way. That's actually, I reached out to a couple of people when I was laid off um, during COVID and they're like, that's also, well, not awesome, but like, you have time to help me now. Great. Help me prove out the value. Two of the contracts that I did were like, hey, we want to bring you on full time. They're up in Philadelphia. I was never gonna, I'm not going to move back there. Um, but yeah, just having a network, tapping into that and, you know, 
I was very open about what happened and that actually helped with consulting work. And then once the world opened up again, open up again, but people went off hiring freezes and stuff like that. Like I'm still getting, I get pinged like almost every other day about like, we have this new research role, like interview, come on, like layoffs happen. Don't cry about it for a day or two, take what you need and then get right back on the horse because there are going to be opportunities out there for you. That was a really long-winded answer, Eric. I'm sorry, were there any other questions? <laughs> that was like me up on a soapbox, sorry. Uh, the next question I have to ask is, when you were getting hired, how did your master's degree help with you? Like when you were applying for jobs and going into the interviews, how do you think that your master's degree in HCI really helped you get to where you are? Yeah, so my master's degree, like, and, and the projects that I did during my master's were, um, you know, my, my final capstone project was in e-commerce, cultural differences, looking at that. I knew about industries that I was interested in and that I wanted to go into. So I was able to tailor big projects towards that. And then I have the ability to showcase um, my research process throughout that because during my master's, like we did go through that. Um, I was able to showcase like group projects and, and things like that, which helped me really just like show folks of like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I don't necessarily have industry experience, but like when it comes to actually like executing on research and stuff, I know a process, I know it needs to be done. My results are reliable and valid and I know how to communicate that across to folks. So that has tremendously helped me. Um, you know, I think, I think there's this leveling off is this like, you don't have your master's, but you have like, you know, six to eight years within industry versus you have your master's and you have two to three years in industry, you you could like pretty come neck to neck. I think then it comes to like some other variables and dimensions and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, early in my career, my master's degree uh, like really helped me elevate above those who like didn't and who were trying to like break into the industry with without it, if that made any sense. Do you have any advice for young researchers looking to break into this industry? Yeah, we'll get into my next few bullet points. Young researchers, okay, for UX research specifically, um, you know, for, for this career, I'll go back up to the um, first bullet of what I tell folks who just wanna reach out and talk to me about research. Do your homework on like, if you wanna go into research or design, or if you do have a passion for both, great. Um, there are some like nuances there of what you want to get into to make sure you're not spread too thin and then you can meet expectations and execute on work and stuff. You know, I've had um, researchers on my team who three months in and they're just like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I actually want to like deliver something, right? I don't like analysis. I want to like build something and put something together. It's like, all right, research might not be the best the best for you. But now I've actually worked with two designers. I have one right now that currently is joining the dedicated research function at Rig Up, who's like, you know what, design's great and I love it. You know what, I'm way more interested in the research. I'm way more curious about things that are way upstream. Like, can I join your team? Help, help me, shepherd me along and mentor me, right? So as soon as you, and, and that might change, right? I think now people are more open and once you spend a year or two or however much time you need in that, then you're like, no, I'm more interested in this. But kind of like really reflect on that. I think it's easy for me to say because I was always interested in research. I knew I didn't want to go into design. I still don't want to ever go into design. Um, but you know, just do a little self-reflection on which one you think you'd be more passionate about and want to pursue. That would help like people like me, like hiring managers to help you achieve the goals that you really want to. You also want to decide if you want to go in-house or agency. So that's, I want to say like depth versus breadth. So in-house, you're going to get very deep experience with a lot of different cross-functional partners, right? So it's your engineering partners, that's your product managers, that's your marketing department, that's your sales, that's your operations. You're day in and day out, very close to all of them. Versus agency, you might not go in as deep with those teams, but you might have a breadth of different clients you're working for and maybe different projects like that. You also want to think about industries that you're interested in. Um, I do say, and and for um, a couple of the companies I'm at specifically, like the e-commerce companies, like you don't need e-commerce industry experience. Like 
our methodologies, which is nice, and this goes across design too, methodologies are really able to adapt and really cross over to different industries. However, for research specifically, if you think about um, like finance versus e-commerce, Finance is going to have a lot more like security, privacy, a lot like you got to log in a VPN, things like that. If you want to go into health and medical research, UX research, you know, you have to think about HIPAA constraints you have there, red tape there, e-commerce. There's also a little bit more like flexibility with some of these industries where you can be a little creative. I always, you know, with e-commerce, we're like, you know, at the end of the day, if I mess up a study, if I, you know, make a mistake, like no one dies. So it's like low risk in that, in that area, but the business metrics of like having to sell and your margins and, and things like that. So just give it a thought. Like I, I had a handful of industries I knew I was interested in. So again, I, I positioned my work to, to speak to those industries and to be able to build my domain knowledge off of them. And then also that company size and maturity. So that's that, that's like that one, just like, you don't have to spend much time on just like have them as like floating thoughts as you know, you're going throughout your, your time in college. To break into the research um, industry or however we wanna put it, put it, things that I, you, these two next things like you need to please, please do. Practice presenting your work, you know, writing and communicating and presenting are three huge things that like I learned very early on in my master's program that it's like, whoa, I need to work on that and has been something that has not changed throughout my entire career. Being able to communicate your thought process, to communicate your, your findings, to be able to write succinct reports about those and hand them off to exec teams, so important. So the earlier that you can work your, your brain muscles to do that, please just, just do it. <laughs> like that is like the one piece of, you know, advice that I could give, like as early as possible, start doing that. Take every opportunity to present that, that you can. Um, in my master's program, I remember Chris Harris was like, you know, if no one volunteers, we're going to pick names out of hats. And I was the only one who volunteered. I was the first one to go. I was so nervous, but it, it paid off. It was really good. Also build a website, build a brand. <laughs> create portfolio pieces. You might say, Liz, well, I have no experience. So how am I going to build portfolio pieces? My next slide or two gets into that. Don't have it as an afterthought. A lot of times it is an afterthought. Like, but when I go into things earlier in mid-career, it was putting together my portfolio, being able to build that, being able to showcase what I can do, what I understand, successes that I've had. It is a lot of overhead, especially if you wait till the end of it to just put everything together. Because if you want to go into UX, whether that's design, research, product management, if you go in with a subpar website or a subpar experience for a website, that's going to reflect on you. I mean, like, why if, if what you put together doesn't translate into a good experience, why do you want to build or, you know, research good experiences for users? Um, so start early as possible on that. It, it is a big payoff. When you think about your, your resume and that, that is important, your website, especially now in industry is becoming even more important. It's the first touch points you have with a hiring manager. So as a hiring manager, yes, very, very, very important. Um, some other things that you can do to prepare for, to, you know, for the research industry and even the design industry too. Um, sign up to be a tester. A lot of folks don't think about this, but there's a lot of way, like whether that's online surveys, whether that's joining focus groups, um, usertesting.com, userzoom.com, sign up to be a tester. You can also make a couple extra dollars as a college student, but this is really, it'll be cool to see what companies are doing, um, how they ask questions, how they're bringing you through different flows, you know, the different wordings of like not leading you or, or things like that. Um, and you, know, you might be able to see a lot of different types of like, you know, um, usability level research versus more like generative, maybe strategic level insights and stuff like that. And they're fun. So that's sometimes not thought about, do that. It's, it's a great way to start to really understand it as a career. Also reach out and ask if it's possible to shadow someone in a role that you're interested in. Kind of going back on that reflection of whether you, you know, it's research or design, or maybe it's product management that you haven't even thought of. Reach out to someone and just, you know, be like, hey, I'm interested. Can I shadow you for a half day? And then, you know, 
we can have lunch and debrief or, or, or something like that, or maybe for a whole day. I know COVID has a little bit of implications and stuff like that, but reach out and even ask if it's possible. If you have to get an NDA in place, sign that, and then we'll pick a good day for you to come and shadow. I also want to talk about, you know, if, if you can't get in foot in the door with internships and stuff, so rig up. My company, we currently don't have a dedicated internship program. We just rolled out our career ladders, what it means, how you can level up and stuff like that. And I promise you an internship like program or, you know, whatever it's, it's coming. So if you are interested, stay in touch with me. I promise it's going to be a thing. Everyone wants it. Internships are super interns and internships are super helpful. I think for both sides. And especially when it's like a good program that wants you to have really good output for it as well. Um, any questions there? I know we have about 16, 17 minutes. I will share a couple of the other slides that I put together. So I just pulled this to give you all an idea of, you know, when you're looking, when, you know, maybe you're just thinking like, maybe I'm interested in research, maybe I'm interested in design, what are the differences actually in roles and stuff? So I pulled these two slides off of Indeed um, for this People Insight team, which I actually talked to the hiring manager, I think last year, really a great team. They're hiring a UX designer and separately they're hiring a UX researcher. So here you can see that the UX research position is more about you know, informing a vision. It's more about you know, prioritizing research needs, um, working through a lot of different methodology, doing generative and evaluative research throughout stages of development. So you're not just, you know, doing research before and never, you know, looking into it after when something's built. Um, and this last sentence, oh, big picture for product vision, right? Strategy, delivering on short-term and long-term needs. And that's something that's really uh, pivotal in like where I'm at in my career. It's being able to execute on really quick hit things, decision-making, things like that, but also this longer term, um, more strategic level research. Versus the UX design is more about delivering a product. And I'll say this is for Amazon. I'm not saying this is like across the board. It, it's just pretty similar in terms of like how my research positions have been positioned against design positions at pretty much all the companies that I've been at. Anyways, design is more about delivering a product, you know, understanding you at user centered design and the principles there, you know, help informing roadmaps, future concepts, things like that, that it's, it's really on delivering that, that product and putting something together. So, you know, spend some time, Indeed, LinkedIn, Google, you know, UX research positions versus UX design positions, see what some of the different roles and responsibilities are. Are there any questions there? I have a few, but I'm going to hold them until the end of your presentation so you can get all the way through. Cool. Yeah, just one more. So, or two more slides. Um, so this is the portfolio. A lot of times I get like, well, I don't, I don't have the experience. So how am I supposed to build portfolio pieces? It's fine. There are ways to get it. So as you're building your website that I had said, super important, document that process, document your thought process, put together wireframes, you know, if you want to go into design, Research was a, was a little bit different for me, um, but I did document that about like thought processes of like information hierarchy, um, you know, and you can user test that with hiring managers like me. If you want me to, you know, user test your website of like, find this or, you know, the, does this resonate with you? Like, does this get this across? Things like that. You can also choose a website or app that you love, that you hate, that you have a love-hate relationship with bring in friends and family, write your research plan, write your script, get all your recording set up, test it with your friends and family, right? Put together a report, presentation, whatever like that, and provide those recommendations for improvements that this company or any company could really action on. You can also look online for sample data sets. Um, the government has data sets, like a lot of different websites have sample data sets and use them to create data visualizations. So how you can take, whether that's large or small amounts of data together and patch them into a really nice engaging visualization to get across you know, the point of, of this data, whether it's showing you know, differences or an increase to, to decreasing or, or changes or trends over time. Also, do not hesitate to use your projects from school. like. My first website was all just projects from school. I couldn't really pull anything from user testing. Um, so they were all just projects from, from my master's program, right? 
but the way that my reports were built for you know school wasn't necessarily the same way that hiring managers and and you know companies wanted to see it. So do your research on how to position those, those projects and what the outcomes were to appeal to a broader audience. Also, you could use your test those with, with hiring managers like myself as well. So here's some just like user research, UX um, kind of inspiration resources. These are ones that I constantly go back to that are very integrated into my life. Blogs and newsletters are like one of the most important things that I make sure to read, to tap into um, constantly. It's, it's literally every day. These are my top ones, Nielsen Norman Group, D Scout, Measuring You if you're interested in a lot of like a quantitative kind of research practices, UX Collective, a lot of, it's a good resource for like opinions to see what like other folks in the industry are doing, wins that they've had, other challenges. Um, and then if you can sign up for a media membership, um, I have media membership, I personalized it. So I just get all of these different UX articles, data science articles, product management articles pushed to my uh, inbox and they're just super fun to read too. And really helpful if I'm like stuck on something or if I wanna see how someone else did it, maybe things like that. Couple books, so that craft or research book that's linked into here, uh, a new edition came out. I have the third edition, the fourth edition just came out. Super helpful. I got that during my cognitive science, I believe, uh, degree. And I really leaned on that for um, throughout my HCI degree as well as uh, really early on in my career. It's also a couple new books dedicated to UX researchers and that practice. Um, so think like a UX researcher, Philip Hodgson and David Travis out of the UK put that together. Really great introductory book. I bought it because I wanted to read it because I think it's really always good to like kind of go back to, to your roots. Um, and then a new book by Greg Bernstein called uh, Research Practice. It's literally the newest UX research, dedicated UX research book. Highly recommend that if, if you're interested in just learning more about it and like the changing perspectives and how this practice has really evolved over the last decade or so. If you're into podcasts, not super into them. I do try to listen to them um, when I can though. Mixed methods, awkward silences, dollars to donuts, all great introductory ones to help you out, get you an idea of research. Slack channels to join too, just seeing if there's like events or other folks in the industry or opportunities, research ops and mixed methods. If you just follow those links or Google them, um, you have to ask for an invite. You just get sent to your inbox. And places to sign up to be a pastor, like I said, user testing, user Zoom, and then a list of just like online survey places that you can uh, take. Also just Google like local, like Syracuse, New York, like research, like uh, opportunities or, you know, focus groups or, or anything like that. And you can sign up to be a tester and then take screeners and maybe get placed into a test and make some extra money and meet some folks. Okay, that is all I have for you. Here's my contact information. Um, you can visit my website. It has been under construction for a little bit, <laughs> but you can see, I think there's some case studies in there. You can see kind of um, my thought processes and how I structured them. That's my email, feel free. If you're very interested and wanna learn more, I do a lot of just like one-on-one -on -one conversations of just, you know, answering some deeper level questions or, you know, reviews, anything like that. And feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, I have a couple that I stacked up uh, throughout the last couple slides so I can make sure that you finish. Awesome. Uh, from your perspective on the other side of the hiring process, what advice would you give to somebody without connections or experience to get their foot through the door? <sighs> okay, so without, uh, is that like without connections at a company? I'm going to assume yes. Like, okay. So it's like going into a new company, don't have your foot in the door. Honestly, you have to think about like, when you think about the whole hiring process, right? There are different touch points within there. The biggest one, like the first touch point that you're going to have one, your online presence, right? So that's your LinkedIn, that's whatever social media you have. It's your website and your resume. You want to like, it's so hard to say, like get those across to your hiring manager and, and stuff like that. But it is it is really important. Like if I see that someone, if someone comes in, um, if I get like two resumes on my desk and one has a website and one doesn't have a website, I'm gonna prioritize the person who does have a website. As I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna look at their case studies. I'm gonna, you know, 
look at their thought process. And it's also um, something that that I've really valued during time of like talking to other researchers and hiring people is I is having like really established kind of uh, principles when you go in of thoughts that like like my principles of are like I take a creatively crap creatively pragmatic approach to research, right? Um, my other one is that I'm proactive over reactive. So I try to get ahead of anything that I can early on. And so I try to communicate those throughout too. So having things that um, are, that I'm more so I guess passionate about or always wanna bring through and, and try to echo that. Um, God, like, yeah, I mean, I guess I didn't have any connections at Urban Outfitters, but I had a really, I was super passionate about the company write a cover letter. I know, I think cover letter, I don't know if cover letters are dying and stuff, but I, I think they're really important. Your recruiters are pretty much always going to read them. So if you can tap into an emotional aspect of like showing them how passionate that you are, you're probably going to make it to a hiring manager to just at least see. And even if you don't get a call back there, like there's been times where it's just like, nah, maybe not a good fit for the position, specific position I'm looking for right now, but it's like, hey, I wanna flag this person of like, when the position does want to, does arise that I think would be a better fit for them, let's let's be make sure that we tap into them and, and keep in contact with them. Um, yeah, that's like outside of like not having connections. I mean, try to reach out to folks who do work, work there. Um, you know, do you add them on LinkedIn, learn about you know, different backgrounds there and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, doing doing those kind of like small things and really trying to push through about how passionate you are, either about their company, about their industry and things like that would go a long way, I would say. So to go along with that question, I think this one kind of follows along with it. Um, one of the questions was, I don't have any experience in UX design or being a researcher, but I am currently studying HCI as a master's program. Like what information would you have in that position to help her help them land a job in this field like what would you expect them to kind of bring to the table having the hci as a master yeah i mean it's an understanding so something also that i think benefited me out um while getting my hci degree was actually the way that the, the program was laid out so i had insights into just i knew i wanted to go into research so every group project that we went into i made sure to like that's where my time was focused. That's where I wanted to concentrate. And that's what I was dedicated to. However, I also took web design. I took software development. I, you know, had to take the computer science courses and stuff like that. So I had an, uh, a working kind of working knowledge of those other kind of um, domains and, and roles. So that it was like when I transitioned to these, um, you know, into industry and stuff like that. I wasn't just like lost in conversations when UX designers were, were talking about something and, and I was able to, to bring things up in my interview because I did have that knowledge from, from my master's degree. So I would expect people to have that same kind of like breadth of experience of like, hey, I did the due diligence. I learned more about these different roles and how to interface with them, what matters to them, you know, constraints they're fighting for. But also like, I'm super passionate about research and here are all my projects that like you know, I worked with designers. I worked with people who are more on the engineering side. You know, I, I do did my due diligence to put together like a project management timeline and things like that. So you can showcase both both those aspects. I would pretty hands down expect that from anyone coming out of a master's program. What tools or software do you use the most when you're working on a research project? Oh boy, uh, <laughs> across companies. Um, User testing is a big one. You know, I did start my career there. I do believe, I, and I have, I still though, yeah, I have this bias and belief that like user testing is the best in the game for remote unmoderated research. So I do still vet other companies. I just went through, you know, proof of concept with user zoom. I did one with user lytics and stuff like that. Um, user testing is a huge one, huge tool to work with. Um, I am in and out of Excel constantly. It's where we do all of our analysis and synthesis. Um, there are other ways that you, you could do. You could use different um, softwares. Like you could use Trello's. You could use, you know, wh whatever your preference is there. Mine is Excel. So, so I use that. And that's something that I use, you know, throughout my master's and, and everything like that. A lot of Slack messaging um, in and out of the emails. I use userinterviews.com as well to help source for, um, for different um, 
you know, participant profiles that are outside of our um, kind of database that we have. I use otter.ai for transcriptions. Um, other tools. We use SurveyMonkey. It's not my favorite surveying tool, but um, that's what we use. Hopefully our UX research team will have kind of a more robust tool. Um, yeah, a lot of Google slide presentation. We use Miro a lot. I don't know if you guys know like Miro or Mural, not my favorite, Miro or real-time board. Um, it's like this collaborative like whiteboarding tool. It's it's so good. Um, I templatize things in there, like our um, experience maps, our personas, just different like processes, being able to visualize things. That's that's a really great tool for visualizations, along with Canva. Yeah, that's they're they're good for uh, visualizations too. That's just the short list. There's there's a lot more, but um, that's at least like the main ones. My next question is, as a UX researcher, are you more responsible for the statistical analysts or are there other roles like the data analysis that is uh, data analysis that is responsible for those? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's going to definitely differ by company. Um, so at, at Urban Outfitters, Urban Outfitters specifically, not your band, Urban Outfitters, we were solely responsible for all things research, whether that was quantitative research, doing the statistical analyses on like larger surveys, things like that, as well as like qualitative, you know, doing the remote unmoderated testing, doing the user interviews, more moderated sessions going, doing in-store research and stuff like that. We were responsible for all of that. Leafly, super different. We were just responsible for all of the qualitative insights. We might have put together and run a survey, but when it actually came to um, identifying any statistical significance or doing any sort of like larger quantitative analysis, we leaned on our data science team to do that. Rig up, it's still up in the air. It's uh, it's up for grabs who like wants to take that and do that. We don't have a really good like quantitative like function or execution on research. So that could live with uh, the user research program that could live with our data science program. It's going to depend on com uh, whichever company you work on. However, it is important to along with the different methodologies that I got to work with in HCI, I worked with a lot of different types of data. So I did, I every kind of project, especially um, for my capstone projects, I positioned things, I would always do something qualitative and quantitative to help back it up. So that is also a really great point that I didn't hit on earlier, try to do that. So I'm gonna combine two questions kind of into one, because I think that they kind of go together, but you could tell me if they don't. Okay. Uh, so from which platform that you kind of touched on earlier, which do you get the most feedback from? And do you have any resources would you suggest that would help improve quantitative and qualitative skills? Um, so measuring you is like pretty much solely dedicated to like quantitative research. Super, super helpful. Um, I go to their site a lot to just like either refresh my memory or, or if I need help with something, they walk you through it. It is a great resource. They also have boot camps. If you have the money, if you have the time, you could sign up for that. If like your quantitative side like really does not like, you don't even know where to start. Um, that's that's a great one. D Scout's going to be more on the qualitative side. Um, I would say think like a UX researcher is really going to help you blend or, or marry those two. Um, that those two type of like data collection, like methodologies and, and stuff like that together. Um, so those would be great resources to, to probably help to at least start you out with it. Okay, so I think that's all the questions that we all have. Uh, I just wanna emphasize to everybody that all of this information will be found on oswego.edu slash imagine2021. And I would just like to say thank you all so much for participating. And on top of that, I would like to thank Liz especially for inspiring us with all of her great information that she provided. And we hope to see you all tomorrow at the Imagine 2021 day session with Claudia Caburse at 10 a.m. See the link in the chat to follow that up. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Bye.